ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. And after three decades, we're back where we started. It's a draw on Anzac Day. Corbin Middlemass getting the hairs on the back of your neck dancing. What a game between Essendon and Collingwood. He's going to join us to discuss the beauty of the draw, who won the day, the Lions being declawed and more. We will also look at the NRL, where Anzac Day delivered drubbings. There's a huge development in the Chinese swimming doping story too. And Ange Postacoglu might help decide the Premier League this weekend. We are diving into that. Plus, sound bites. I'm Patrick Stack. This is ABC Sport Daily. Corbin Middlemass is getting his breath back after a thrilling Anzac Day draw, which has seen a predictable conversation about getting rid of so said draw. Maybe I'm showing my age, Corby, but isn't a draw a kind of unique and beautiful thing? I think so anyway. Uh, I feel like most people that left uh, the ground yesterday walked away pretty satisfied from two and a half hours of footy. It was one of the best editions of the game. I think that we've experienced had a bit of everything. The Bombers kicked four goals in seven and a half minutes and that's not seven and a half minutes of game time. That's seven and a half minutes from when the ball was bounced. The Bombers had already banged through the first four. Pendlebury became the first man to burst through the 10,000 disposal barrier. Josh Dacos, he goes by hand to Pendlebury. Pendlebury with a handball hits the target. And the 36-year-old Scott Pendlebury, the first ever player to reach 10,000 disposals. You had the Bombers leading by 27 points and then five league changes thereafter. Jamie Elliott took the mark of the year. Kicks inside the forward 50, Jamie Elliott! With the air raid! (laughs) Leaps up on the shoulders and takes a hanger on Anzac Day! Both teams had multiple chances to to try and win it late. So uh, it was a a rollicking day at the footy in front of a huge crowd and and such a moving ceremony beforehand, which is always the case on on Anzac Day. And I think the other thing which is underrated is it adds another wrinkle into the season. Two points each. The Bombers, four wins, one draw and two losses, while Collingwood straight down the middle, 3-3 and 1. And all of a sudden now that half game is going to play a role as the season progresses. Is it going to be the you know, the two points that either gets Essendon into the eight or narrowly misses out? And the same goes for uh, for Collingwood, although we all expect them to to be there in the finish. Is it going to determine how high they, they end up in the top eight at the end of the season? Maybe the only thing this draw failed to deliver was perhaps a definitive resolution about where these two teams are with their season to date. I'm just a simple footy fan, Corb. You are highly evolved. Did you gain more clarity <laughs> on either side's journey? Yeah, I think it was good for Essendon. I always ask the question at the end, sort of, you know, who won the draw, who lost the draw? I think there's always a winner and a loser out of it. And and Mick Moldhouse and Cameron Ling were sort of leaning to the fact that Essendon won the draw yesterday. And there were multiple stages, despite the fact that the Bombers kicked six of the first seven and, you know, were up by a big margin. He's ready. Through the middle. And Essendon aggressively built an early lead. I actually felt like there were multiple stages yesterday in the second quarter, third quarter and so on where it felt like Collingwood were just going to run away with the game and burn the Bombers off. And they were never able to. And I think that says a lot about the new Essendon under Brad Scott. He's now had the group for yeah, almost 30 games. And what he's been able to do in that time is clearly fix up their defensive effort. And we saw that yesterday. Uh, again, it certainly was on display in their two wins against Adelaide and the Bulldogs in the past fortnight. So I think the fact that the Collingwood were never able to do that to Essendon yesterday actually says a lot about you know, this rising Essendon team. So I think they'll walk away relatively satisfied, despite the fact that, you know, like Collingwood, there'll be a few moments... Uh, uh, so what might have been moments late in the piece for uh, for the Dons as well. The Lions are in real trouble after being thumped by Greater Western Sydney. Paul Roos, Premiership coach of the Swans, was talking on ABC AFL Daily. I was fascinated to hear him analyse it as one team is selfless and one team is selfish. Can you see Brisbane contending from this position? I can't, to be honest. I don't think from two and five you can pull it back from here. I mean, that's their biggest loss of the season so far. It was one in which they actually led in the second quarter and then conceded the next nine goals. So the Giants have it at centre-half forward. Perryman might have a shot from here as well. This could get ugly. Kicks from 52. Rides it all the way home. Party time for the Giants to extend their lead past 50. They lose Kalachi on the run. 
And now they play the Q Clash, so they get Oscar McInerney back for that. But forget fighting for the might of the country and, and their position in the game nationally at the moment. They're now fighting just to defend their status in Queensland as the number one team in town. So that's a fascinating game at a good time for uh, for both teams when they play the uh, the Suns next weekend. But that, they look a long way off at Brisbane for a team that's continuously either been top four or in the final four over the past five seasons under Chris Fagan. That They look like they're going to be flat out just trying to make the eight from here. Two sides expected to contend are Geelong and Carlton. 1v4, this clash, MCG Saturday. Is this a little September primer that we get in April? It's awesome, isn't it? It's just come around at the perfect stage for both teams. So the best record and the equal second best record in the game leading into the weekend. You've got the last four Coleman medalists, and that's a story in itself to think, you know, Hawkins and Cameron at one end and then Kernow and Mackay at the other. You've got Cripps and Dangerfield, so two of the great modern prototype midfielders, you know, big bodies that play in the middle of the ground against one another. Cripps tries to get the clearance. His kick is straight up in the air, and he gathers it himself, the Carlton captain. The Deconing brothers has a little subplot to go against one another, Sam and Tom. And you've got two premiership teammates in the coach's box in uh, in Michael Voss and Chris Scott. So great comparisons. And again, a tremendous test for, for both teams at the right time. Carlton have just taken down GWS despite their growing injury list. They've got about five or six guys out with soft tissue injuries from their best 23. And for Geelong, as good as they've been, and they've got the perfect record, people are looking at the sides that they've beaten and going, okay, so the, their opponent's record combined in 2024 is nine win, 27 losses. So it's not like they've taken down sort of any top team so far this year. And Geelong's defence, quite rightfully, would be, well, we haven't had a chance to play them yet. They get the chance this week to uh, to test themselves against Carlton at the MCG. So expecting a huge crowd. It's a great time slot uh, in that uh, twilight fixture on Saturday. So fingers crossed we, we get a game that delivers against it. Corbin Middlemass and the team are calling footy all weekend on the ABC Listen app. Corb, thanks so much. Anytime. Rugby League, an Anzac Day delivered to beltings in the NRL as the Chooks cooked the Dragons at the SFS, while the Bunnies conceded 50 to the Storm in Melbourne as pressure just builds and builds and builds on Rabbitohs coach Jason Demetrio. There'll obviously be more talk about your job. Like, Do you anticipate you'll be given that time? Like, is, There's been no conversations about anything else? We've got no idea, Jake. You know, that's what I'll turn up to do. Like I've said before, I you know, love coaching this club, love coaching this team. I'll turn up and keep giving me best. And if someone taps me on the shoulder and says that time's up, then it'll it, that, I can't control that. Tense. That sounds tense. Other games of note, the Tigers might have locked in veteran CEO Shane Richardson for four years, but they're staring down the barrel of four straight losses unless they can knock over a Broncos team, welcoming back Adam Reynolds and Payne Haas. The Cowboys, they are desperate to arrest their slide out of the eight as they host Penrith. The Finns have the Knights coming to visit Brizzy. And keep an eye on the last game of the round, the Raiders are bringing back some big names as they try to challenge the second-place Cronulla Sharks. All of that live and free on the Listen app this weekend. If you did not hear about the Chinese swimming story this week, it's a doozy. But too long didn't read? Here's the upshot. 23 swimmers found to have a banned substance in their system ahead of the Tokyo Olympics. Chinese authorities argued the hotel where the team was staying was contaminated with the drug. The World Anti-Doping Agency cleared them. No provisional ban. The revelations have seen an outcry. Yeah, an outcry. And WADA is obviously feeling the heat because today they have announced an independent review of that finding. Swiss prosecutor Eric Cotter will deliver his findings within two months. And with the Paris Olympics just around the corner, yeah, this will be a big story. Everyone is going to be hanging out for those findings. The Premier League title race might be decided this weekend. Ange Postacoglu... Might decide it all too. A man who has covered many of these title races is Daniel Garb. Garby got to start with the North London Derby. Arsenal, they're currently top by a point. Man City has a game in hand. The Gunners take on Ange Postacoglu's Tottenham at home. Spurs need a win here to have a chance of Champions League football next season. The stakes are dizzyingly high. How much will Ange be relishing this? He'll look forward to it enormously. I mean, these are the kinds of moments that he was forecasting in his mind, you know, many years ago before he even emerged on this European football scene. He would have envisaged 
moments like this for himself. Now it is at his doorstep. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm loving it. Um, you know, it's um, it's exactly where you want to be. I'd prefer we were going for the title, but, uh, you know, we're still in a decent position. We want to finish the season strong. So, yeah, no, I'm loving it. He'll be desperate to create some headlines. I mean, he'll want to win for Tottenham, of course. They've got massive stakes ahead of them, as you say, trying to claim a top four spot. But he'll know that his supporter base will want nothing more than to impact Arsenal's hopes of winning the title. We speak about some of the the rivalries in English football. Liverpool, Manchester United's number one. Newcastle and Sunderland, which is right up there as well. Tottenham and Arsenal is at that level. It, it is hatred. It's not a word that we necessarily like to use, but it is there. And Tottenham, more so than Arsenal necessarily, because they've had to watch on as Arsenal you know, won titles and was at the the top of English football for, for decades. And Spurs have struggled to win trophies, but they would love nothing more than to ruin their chances. So, Ange will be very much aware of that, and he knows that if he can engineer a Tottenham win, well, his status in the eyes of the Tottenham fans is elevated even further. He certainly made it clear that he's not particularly intimidated by teams like Arsenal or Man City. You worry watching that given you still got Arsenal Manchester City to No. Another team that was in the mix but may now see their chances fading away is Liverpool, who really blew themselves up with a loss to Merseyside rivals Everton this week. They have to beat West Ham to have any chance of staying alive. Is manager Jurgen Klopp going out with a whimper here, Garby? A little bit. They certainly have to beat West Ham or else there's no hope. I think those hopes have pretty much dwindled anyway. It feels as if they've run out of steam, Liverpool. You know, at a time when you thought they were ready to go to that next level, they've just fallen apart. The Europa League was a sign of that. They went out to Atalanta. And it is the full-time whistle. And Atalanta can celebrate knocking Liverpool out of the Europa League. And there was the Crystal Palace loss at home. There are some reasons. Uh, Mohamed Salah is just nowhere near his usual self. He's not beating opponents. He's not creating opportunities. He looks at the moment like a bit of a passenger out there, which is so unusual for someone who is such a legend of the Premier League, never mind just Liverpool. And there's the ball for Salah, who's got the spin, and Salah has the run, and Mohamed Salah scores, doesn't, into the back of the net for Liverpool. The injuries have perhaps taken its toll on the fluidity of the squads and they just seem like they've run out of petrol, really, at such an important time. It is a marathon, the Premier League title race. Uh, Yeah, it's not the way that they envisaged sending Jurgen Klopp out, but it looks like being uh, an exit with a bit of a whimper. There's the League Cup, it's a trophy, but they had designs on at least going right to the very end of this title race, Liverpool, and uh, they haven't done that. So they need to beat West Ham in the early game on Saturday night or else they can just uh, kiss all of their hopes goodbye completely. Fascinating to see how it all plays out. Daniel Garb, thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Taki. It is soundbite time, and we just spoke about Liverpool potentially blowing up their chances at winning the league, and it's fair to say Everton fans were happy to let them have it. Liverpool fans, in case you missed that, they're saying, you lost the league at Goodison Park. Ouch. Katrina Gorry's daughter, Harper, has become the unofficial mascot of the Matildas in recent times. Although, if you ask her, she might prefer another country. Where are you, Where are you from? from? Um, Sweden. Yes! No, you're not. You're Australian. No, Sweden is <laughs> I beg your pardon. You don't understand. <laughs> I do understand, and you're Australian. Nice win, it's better. We might want to work on getting her back to Team Tilly's ahead of the Olympics. And the NBA playoffs are on right now, and LeBron James has found himself in the headlines after he had some choice words about the refereeing, specifically their replay centre after the Lakers lost Game 2 to the Nuggets by two points. I don't understand what's going on in the replay centre, to be honest. I said it. I think I said it this year or last year or whatever. D'Lo clearly gets hit in the face on a drive. What the f- do you have a replay center? That doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. It makes no sense to me. It bothers me. Sorry to answer your question, but that like... And then I just saw what happened with the uh, Sixers-Nick game, too. What are we, what are we doing? 
That was uh, a literal mic drop. You just heard it. I doubt he's feeling any better, given the Lakers are now 3-0 down in the series. I'm Patrick Stack. This is ABC Sport Daily, produced by Poppy Penny. Thanks to Optus Sport, Stan Sport, Liverpool Football Club, Spurs Chat Podcast, and Katrina Gorry's Instagram for the extra audio used in this episode. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio, and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.